George. I am so delighted. Thank you so very much for this invitation, and I, I just really want to thank you to give an opportunity to me to speak to this uh, wonderful audience you've created over the years, because those are the cultural creatives, the people looking outside the box for the answers you're now finding inside. Absolutely. So, uh, I'm glad to be here for that. How'd you enjoy Santa Cruz? I love Santa Cruz. I've, I've met so many uh, recovering scientists. I couldn't believe how many people like myself that <laughs> were in university systems and then stepped outside because uh, the answers are really not to be found in there. And to find them all down there was such a uh, treasure, and I appreciate you being there. It was a great time. The people there were just so into everything, Bruce, that we were doing, and uh, and the weather was magnificent, wasn't it? Yeah, well, this is uh, this is one of the reasons why I moved this far west to get out there and 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 to find this community because it really is a community that is uh, it, it, the the new thinking, the new, the new ideas are, are coming from here, and I so appreciate being here with them. They love you out there. My gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a hometown boy. <laughs> you are. I mean, I thought for a moment that you know they were going to bring you in, you know, with uh, in some kind of rickshaw or something with people <laughs> carrying you, throwing rose petals at your feet as you came in. Let's go, well, yeah, they're a fun town. That's yeah, why we're here. They sure are. There are so many things I want to talk with you about because it, it isn't very often we get an opportunity to talk with a scientist who also has your belief system. Let's go back way before you became Bruce Lipton, the scientist. What were your beliefs when you were in your 20s, let's say? Well, by then I'd already uh, played with the concept that there was something called spirituality and there was something called science. And by the time I, I was uh, 10 years old, I'd already heard from so many spiritual people. You know, they say all those wonderful words of wisdom and all that. And then even in my child's eyes, I could see that, uh, their lives never match anything that they talk about. <laughs> it. And, and so I really lost interest in that, and, and I went into science and then got programmed into the science, which was the the belief that, uh, oh, life is just the uh, accidental uh, series of genetic mutations that led to this human body, and we're here by accident, and enjoy it, and, uh, and then that's it. And uh, that's where I was in the 20s. Did you have a quest to try to figure out why you're here, how you got here, is there a God? If it was, it surely wasn't conscious at any one level. I was uh, so much into the cells. I, I, first time I saw cells in a microscope uh, in grade school, uh, I, I was just mesmerized uh, to see these little these little moving organisms like amoebas, paramecia, moving around and, and realizing that they weren't bouncing around like a pinball in a machine. They were they were like looking over here, then they moved over here, and they were over there. And so they were yeah, they they were on purpose. And, and in my child's eye, I thought, oh my god, they're they're just like little people living in this other miniature world. And uh, from that moment on, uh, it led me to uh, my graduate work, which uh, ended up being an electron microscopist uh, and, and, and going through cells uh, into the molecular structure of them and, and living in there for a time and, and, and just taking in all the wisdom I could from the, the cells, which was really cool because I didn't start out, as you said, with what's my mission. I started out asking, show me something. Exactly. And, what it showed me was a, a new world and a new life, and, a, and I'm just so excited because my book uh, that I wrote about it, that was out uh, it's, uh, in its 10th year, and it's, it's still selling <laughs> like it, it did in the first year uh, because more and more people are waking up to see that there's a new biology. And this new biology brings in things that you mentioned that I didn't even know were there until the cells revealed it to me, things such as uh, immortality, spirituality, mind over genes, uh, all this other stuff. It's like, oh, my God, uh, I was an avid student. And 10 years uh, of this book, and what was exciting is that Hay House asked me uh, to, uh, you know, how about revise and update the book for a 10th anniversary? I said, okay, and I read the book. I hadn't read it for years. And the joy of it was, Oh my God, I got to the end of the book. I said, no, I'm not changing a word in the original text. All the science in 10 years has fully endorsed everything that was in that book. So um, I just added a bunch of new things to it. Yeah. Uh, but I'm really excited because uh, a vision so long ago is now becoming mainstream science. Would you consider yourself today more of a spiritualist or a scientist? 
<laughs> I'd like to not separate those two. I'm trying. I'm trying to trick you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a spiritual scientist now. <laughs> uh, I mean, it was uh, for me. It was I was not looking for spirituality. So that first of all, that was the, the biggest shock of my whole life. I mean, it was I was looking at an understanding of, uh, of the mechanism of how the cell worked. And uh, when understanding uh, the the structure of the, the the skin of the cell, the cell membrane, it's a it's a computer chip actually. It's a carbon based computer chip. And uh, what I saw was, oh my God, um, the the structure and function of that membrane revealed that our identity is not found inside the cell. Our identity, what makes each of us different, is represented by an environmental signal that is picked up by uh, special proteins like miniature television antennas on the surfaces of our cells. So no two people have the same set of these antennas. It's like a combination lock. of It's receiving identity frequencies from the field. What was the point? That our identities are, are, are picked up from the field and played through the cell through these receptors uh, and what, you know, instantaneously is like, oh, my God, I said, I realized it's like, well, if the cell dies, uh, the signal in the field is always a signal in the field. It's there until a future cell with the same set of receptors shows back up. I love that. Uh, and then that, that uh, broadcast will be playing through a new body. Uh, but the whole idea about it is the broadcast is immortal. We are the broadcast. And it was like <laughs> that moment I just looked at it, I said, wait, I'm not in here. <laughs> and it was, oh, my God. And it didn't, it wasn't like, okay, Bruce, how many years of devotion did it take to, you know, fall into being spiritual? And it's like, well, how about a minute or maybe 45 seconds or something like that? Because it was a mechanism. And it was just as clear as 2 plus 2 is 4. It's like, oh, my God, identity is picked up by antennas on the surface of the cell from signals in the environment. And it was like... Well, that was blew my mind, but it changed everything, you know. And it's real interesting, yeah. uh, George, and all of us have this this feeling inside of us. It's not always conscious, but it's running uh, every day, all day long. It, 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 there, there's something built into all biological organisms called the biological imperative. And I say, well, what's that? I say, well, it's the drive to stay alive. And I go, well, what does that mean? I say, well, even an organism as primitive as a bacterium will not sit there and say, okay, kill me. If you try to kill a bacterium, it's going to do everything it can to stay alive. So every organism from the most primitive bacterium up through humans and above, every organism has this drive to stay alive. And, and what does that mean? It means that we are on guard every moment with our unconscious mind, observing the world, looking for what? Things that threaten us. Yeah. And, right. and, and, and the reason is, is obviously because we grow up to know that we're mortal and, and we gotta watch out. And so there's this on guard all the time, looking at everything, looking everywhere, not keeping your conscious mind, uh, or, you know, uh, involved with it until it sees something, but, uh, it's working all the time. So what happened? The moment I recognized I'm not in here, I'm an immortal being, a broadcast, uh, a spirit that plays through this mechanism, I, I felt this lightning, George. I mean, it was just light, a, a lightning of my body, a lightning of my life. What was it? The fear of death slipped away. The first time in my life, fear of death, just like gone. And what happened? Freedom. It was the most exciting freedom. Very refreshing, wasn't it? Oh, my God. Uh, I mean, for a guy who was zero spirituality and A and B, not looking <laughs> even for it, then to stumble on it was like, oh, my God. Uh, uh, it's funny. I, uh, uh, it was so uh, emotional an experience to understand the mechanism of how the cell worked that uh, I, I've been an academician. I worked from my head 40 years. Everything's from my brain, my brain. The moment this understanding came in about how cells work in spirituality, it wasn't my brain that really affected uh, affected that. It was my heart. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden, I remember at that moment of understanding, tears were coming down my eyes. I was choked up, uh, and I realized I was so so choked up because of my heart. Uh, and I, I now refer to this as my heart orgasm. <laughs> the first time I felt that experience. And, and really what it was was that a truth that was so deep came in. And, and my life changed. Oh, it's, it's got to be profound, Bruce. Once that hits you, 
the way it hit you and so many other people, I hope, get to that stage, it's got to be a profound feeling, isn't it? Oh, I, I, it's, you can't put it in any description that I could try to make that will relay the, uh, the emotional content of touching a, a truth of the universe. And is it a truth? Well, uh, look, uh, I understood this. This was uh, really back by 1980 I started getting all this. And, and every, every bit of science since 1980 has fully substantiated all of that original finding. So uh, to me, it's like, oh, wow, <laughs> I saw this. Yeah, it was kind of fun. There, there, there was a, a, a funny response because there was this moment. I was like, okay, I'm not a spiritual person. And all of a sudden, it's like, okay, spirit exists. And then I was in this little quandary. It's like, I asked myself, well, you know, why have a spirit and a body? Why not just be the spirit? And I could feel the answer welling up through my cells. Apparently, I must have Jewish cells because I asked the question, <laughs> why have both? And the answer came in the form of a question. And the question is, like, very funny but very profound. I said, why have both a spirit and a body? Why not just be a spirit? And the answer from 50 trillion cells was simply this. Bruce, if you're just a spirit, what does chocolate taste like? You know, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> it makes well, a lot it, of sense, and you, and you could equate that with a lot of things on this planet. Well, it's, that's the whole point of it. We have a nervous system that responds to sensory input. And I go, well, that's really nice, but guess what? The signals that bring the identity into the body are the same receptors that forward the message back to source again, so that... When you taste something, you see something, you hear something, you smell something, when you feel something like love or fear, um, those are sensory perceptions that are translated by the nervous system into vibration. So a picture that you see with your eyes is actually a bunch of vibrations that go to the brain, or a taste of chocolate is a bunch of vibrations that go to the brain. I go, well, they go to the brain, but guess what? We also now know that those signals that come into the brain that we sense, are not locked in our head. And I say this because uh, there's interesting science, and it's based on, uh, well, everyone's familiar with EEG electroencephalograph. You put wires That's on a right. person's uh, skull, uh, and you can read the electrical activity of the brain because the electrical activity is conducted to the skin, and the wires pick it up, and you can read brain function. I go, yeah, great. But there's a new technology, and it's called not electroencephalograph. It's called magnetoencephalograph. So it reads magnetic fields. What's interesting, the probe does not touch your head. The probe is outside of your Outside head. of your skull, isn't it? Outside yeah. of your skull. has no connection to your body at all. And what are you doing? You're reading your brain function. And all of a sudden, so what does it mean? There's only one simple understanding. Your thoughts are not contained in your head. Your thoughts are broadcast out into the field. And, hmm. and all of a sudden, it's like, oh, my God. This is this two-way street uh, that that we're sort of like um, uh, a simple way to put it is uh, we're like a a Mars rover in this regard. It's a, essentially, let's say I want to know what Mars is like, but I can't get there. But I really want to know what a human experience of Mars would be. So I send up this rover, and it looks like a fancy go kart and all that kind of stuff. And I, I say, yeah, but it, no matter what it looks like, guess what it is? It's the equivalent of a human. It has eyes to see with. It's got taste receptors to sample the soil. It's got, and the it's got wheels like legs. It's got move around. It, yeah. it, it does everything. But guess what? So the guy at NASA sends a signal, drives the rover around, but the rover, meanwhile, is picking up with all its sensory apparatus information about what it's like to be, all the, you know, the experiences of living on Mars, and sends it back to the guy at NASA via you know, the same antenna. I'm going, we, and this is the cool part, <laughs> we are like earth rovers. We came here, we jump into this virtual reality suit with our antennas, we're connected to the suit, and whatever the suit uh, experiences, that information is translated into vibration, which is then sent back to source. So we came here for these experiences. Uh, and then, of course, since just like the rover, there's a driver, it moves the vehicle around, so it's not random. We came here on a mission as Earth rovers to experience life. And, and, and what's so exciting about it is, is that 
well, a lot of people think, okay, you, you're dead, then if you have a good life, you can go to heaven. I'd like to suggest something that's totally cosmically weird and different, and that is, no, no, you were born into heaven. You were born to be here to do what? Take that consciousness that spirit represents, but turn it into a device that moves around on the planet, can do things, and can take the experiences and send it back. So we came here for experiences. And uh, uh, unfortunately, we've been hijacked. <laughs> so, yeah, that's uh, true. I, I said, well, this is heaven, and you look around and go, it sure doesn't look like it. I go, well, uh, that's because we've been hijacked. We've been programmed to to lose our mission, and uh, we lost it. And uh, But it's available for us to come back and recognize this was heaven. This is where we came to create. This is great. I have always wondered with remote viewers how they are able to, and I practice it too now, but how they were able to remote view things, past and present, by being outside of their body, their minds would go out and literally become their eyes and see things in the future or see things from the past. And it's much like what you're saying. It's like everything is outside of the human body. It's this tapping into this wireless internet out there, Bruce, that yeah. allows you to do this. It's the field, and when you can tap into the field, that's where people's intuitions come from. If you can tap into it and yep. let go of your Earth-based moment and get out for a moment, you can come back with all this amazing information. It's all out there, uh, but we've been programmed not to see it. We've been programmed to go away from it. We've been programmed not to pay attention to our biology, in a sense. It's, a, it's an amazing uh, turnabout for uh, this biology, because what is should be heaven, uh, for most people, this is a hell of a life for a lot of people. <laughs> and, yeah. and, uh, and yet, we have this great opportunity. So uh, an interesting point about it is uh, uh, the, the movie The Matrix uh, when you go into the video store, you say, where, where, where do I find the Matrix? And they say, oh, it's in science fiction. I go, no, you know what? It's a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> well we said. Have, we have been programmed. And, and it's interesting because uh, we, people have had an opportunity. Most people have taken the red pill at one time or another in their life. And, and it had a profound impact when they took the red pill. And, and you say, well, when was that? And I say, science has recognized is that when we fall in love. Bruce, that- we're going to come back with you in just a moment, talk more about all your work and the power of consciousness on Coast to Coast AM. Okay, we're back with Dr. Bruce Lipton. His website, by the way, linked up at coasttocoastam.com is brucelipton.com as we talk about his works, the honeymoon effects, spontaneous evolution, the biology of belief as well. Bruce, have you continued that quest of trying to decide and, and find out why are we here, or have you passed that? and gone on to something else. <laughs> well, uh, as I was leaving off, I, I, I really think is because we came here to, to create, uh, and, and we came with a mission. Uh, and I, I, I think what we're really trying to, to see is an evolution that's in process right now, so that it's all coming together, uh, and, and it's kind of interesting because it, as this evolution is in process, we're also seeing the termination of the current civilization uh, which is required to make room for this new evolution that's, that we're on the threshold of right now. So when we look around at the world and see all the crises, and we can focus on each individual crisis and talk about each individual one, it, it really is one overall big crisis that covers all of them, and that is uh, that we are not sustainable and that we're facing our own extinction. And it really requires us to make an evolutionary jump at this time. And so... Uh, well, a lot of people are looking out and, of course, uh, rightfully feeling fear and, and anxiety about uh, the future of what's happening here and, and seeing all the trouble. I, I look at it in a, a very different way. It's like this is very exciting <laughs> because this mm. is uh, the birth pain of creating a new civilization. We're ending an existing civilization and moving into uh, a new civilization. And, um, again, this is why uh, I so appreciate your audience, because they, they fully represent cultural creatives in this movement. When you have talked about the basics of biology of belief, explain that. 
Well, okay, as I started out in, a, in my non-spiritual form, I, I was a conventional biologist, and I was looking at the nature of uh, cell mechanics and mechanisms. I was focusing on cells ever since my, my uh, uh, elementary school days. And uh, what I was working on was um, what controls the fate of a cell. Well, of course, uh, at the same time I was doing this research, I was teaching students that genes control life because that's my program, too. I got a program, genes control life, and we always talk about things like genes turning on and off and genes uh, uh, actually um, determining our fate in life. And I'm teaching that, and then in, in my uh, laboratory, and this is back 48 years ago, um, I was cloning stem cells, and, and uh, all of us have stem cells. Uh, uh, another name for stem cell, more accurate one, the embryonic cell. Uh, uh, that's what it is, uh, but when you're, after you're born, uh, before you're born, I can say that's an embryonic cell. After you're born, I, I can't call it an embryonic cell. You're not an embryo. We change the name. It's called stem cell. You say, so why do I have stem cells in my body? And the answer then turns out is that every day we lose hundreds of billions of our cells die every day. Normal, just that's aging, normal attrition. I mean, the entire lining of the digestive tract, a trillion cells, is replaced about every three days. So uh, there's a massive amount of turnover and you have to replace these cells, so you're always growing, if you think about it, because you're always dying every day, and every day you're growing and replacing all the cells, and they come from stem cells. So as I was teaching that genes were controlling life, I, I was cloning stem cells back then, and that meant I took one stem cell, put it in a Petri dish by itself. It divides every 10 or 12 hours. After uh, a week, uh, I have about 50,000 cells in the Petri dish, but the most wow. important fact is they're all genetically identical because they came from the same from the same parent. Now I say, yeah, but what was the experiment? And here's what the experiment was. Um, I take the cells from that main dish and split them into three dishes, so I have genetically identical cells in three different dishes, but I change the culture medium, the environment in which the cells live, by changing the chemistry a little bit in each dish. In one dish, uh, the cells form muscle. In the second dish, the cells form bone. And in the third dish, the cells form fat cells, each in these different environments. Uh, and then you come down with the, the most fundamental question. Well, what controls the fate of the cells? And the first thing is, they were all genetically identical. So the first thing, you can't say genes did this. What did it was the environment. It was the culture medium composition. And you go, well, okay, that's a nice experiment with cells in a plastic dish. And, and then I say, okay, now let's take a giant step here and recognize this, is that when you look in the mirror, George, you see yourself as a single human being. I go, well, that is true in one sense and a misperception in another sense in that you're not a single entity. You're made out of 50 trillion cells. The, the cells are the living entity. Me, you, anybody listening on this call, call right now, uh, when you say your name, that's a name that represents 50 trillion sentient cells living in a community. So the, the, the joke, in a sense, is a human being is a skin-covered Petri dish. <laughs> 50 trillion cells in it. And I go, well, what, what, what's the culture medium? Well, blood, because when I make culture medium in the lab, I try to replicate the composition of the blood from the animal from which I get the cells. So I grow rat cells. I use rat blood, try to make culture medium using that composition. Grow human cells, I use human blood. So I said, well, what's the point? And here it comes down to simply this, is the fate of the cells was not controlled by genes. It was controlled by the information in the environment, which was the culture medium. And I go, okay, then it doesn't make a difference if the cell is in a plastic dish or a skin-covered dish. Its fate is being controlled by the culture medium, the composition of the blood. And then, oh, then you say, oh, okay, in the lab, I manufacture the culture medium. And I say, yeah, but in your body, who's in charge of making the culture medium, the composition? I go, well, the brain does that. And then, and then I say, yeah, but what chemistry should the brain use in making the blood? And I go, it's based on the mind. So in other words, if you open your eyes and you see someone you love and your mind gets in the interpretation of love, it releases these wonderful chemicals, dopamine, oxytocin, vasopressin, growth hormone. It releases these hormones into the blood, which is the culture medium, and those signals control the genetics and the fate of our cells. And it, it, just to show you what, what happens if you open your eyes and you see somebody out there that threatens you, 
oh, you release completely different chemistry. You change the composition of the culture medium. Now you add stress hormones and inflammatory agents to the culture medium, and it has a different fate. Point? The fate of the cells is not controlled by genes. It's controlled by the environment, which is the blood, which is in turn controlled by our perceptions and our beliefs and our attitudes. Change your belief, you change the chemistry. Can, well, I was going to say, can you change a cell by thinking something? Absolutely. Absolutely. Here's an interesting, just, just a, how intensely focused this is, is if I could hypnotize you, George, and I say, I'm going to touch you with a burning cigarette on your arm, and I just touch you with my finger. But your subconscious hypnosis state, you, you see it, you perceive it as a cigarette or a right. burn. Right, so I bolt back. You bolt back, and guess what? Within a couple of minutes, you're going to have a blister. I said, well, how could you get a wow. blister? You didn't get burned. It's like, yeah, but the mind overrides the, the body. Good so point. when the mind interpreted the burn, it knew where you got touched. It knows where you are. And where you got touched, it will then generate a complete blister response only because of the mind's perception that that's what happened. And all of a sudden, you realize, oh, my God, the simple truth is that Less than 1% of disease on this planet is related to genetics. The other 90, 99% of disease is lifestyle and belief. I am uh, perplexed by the human being. And, and let me throw out, yeah, take out the God uh, part of this. Yes. But, you know, here we are as humans on this planet. We need eyes to see. We have them. We need ears to hear our environment and to communicate. We have those. We have a mouth to eat, to speak. We have that. It's an amazing mechanism, this body of ours. Why has our environment, how did this get created? I mean, how is it so smart, Bruce, that it creates the eyes, the ears, the nose, the mouth, for everything we need to communicate, to exist? How did it do, how did it know how to do that? Well, it's so wonderfully interesting that cells are intelligent. We have to recognize this, number one. Cells are intelligent. Uh, we, when, as humans, we have the hubris of anything less than human. It's not so intelligent. It's less intelligent. And as you go down a few steps, a few animals down, then you, you go, oh, what about the intelligence of a starfish? It's like, huh? <laughs> you know, huh. a snail, a worm. I go, what about the intelligence of a cell? And so here's the beautiful part. We have to stand back and recognize this. This human body that we inhabit was created by cells. Cells got together in a community and put this thing together. Uh, and so basically we have to recognize cellular intelligence is amazing. And cells, as I've studied them and have learned now, uh, they are always evolving by reading environmental signals and then adjusting their biology and their genetics to complement the signals. Uh, it's interesting, is, uh, as I said, only 1% of disease is related to the genes. 99% is from lifestyle and beliefs. And, a, and the important part about this is you can, you, 90 some percent of us come with a perfect set of genes. The ill health that we have is not the body's problem, it's, it's our perceptions and our beliefs, because that is what ultimately controls those genes. And, and uh, let's go back to the cellular intelligence part. And I said, as cells started to evolve, they started to come together in communities, and then the communities had an architecture, and you might say, okay, where the heck did that architecture come from with all this design? Uh, and then comes this beautiful little insight from mathematics, and that is that um, the nature, physical nature, is uh, built on a fractal geometry. You go, well, what, the, what does that mean? It says that... The, the structures at any level of the organization, from the atoms to the molecules to the cells to the people to humanity, all share the same patterns. And that's how come, as a cell biologist, when I do research on cells, it, it applies to human, human health issues. Why? Because the functions of the cells are the same functions as in a human. Cells see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. Uh, but when they came together in community, they partitioned out the functions and then created individual groups of cells that would take on the function of seeing. Versus, I mean, a cell can see. It's got a receptor that reads photons of light. And so when the light's on, the cells know about it. So I say, well, when you put a trillion cells together, you can put, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of cells in, in, and just say, look, your cells, you take that specialized function of catching light 
and, and then create a, a, a structure that gets the whole range of the spectrum. Uh, and it's just more and more cells, just emphasizing what any individual cell can do. So um, this intelligence is built in. Then you might say, well, okay, so where does the structure come from? And this is, this is exciting. <laughs> this is genesis. And it goes like this. <clears throat> Imagine before life was on this planet, uh, the planet was inorganic, inorganic chemistry, rock, salt, uh, minerals, crystals. <clears throat> and I say, uh, and where did life come from? I say, oh, life comes from the beam of the sun hitting the surface of the earth and essentially etches the surface where the beam hits it. And it turns that inorganic chemistry into organic chemistry, which is the life form. So I go, well, this is, this is really cool. I, uh, I, I'm creating uh, life by taking light from Father Sky and combining it with inorganic chemistry from Mother Earth, and that enlightened chemistry becomes organic chemistry in the basis of life. You go, well, that's really nice and cool and all that, but where's the point? And the point I'm trying to get, George, is that it's an etching where the sun uh, hits the surface. That's why there's a greener belt around the equator than there is at the poles because there's more etching at that point. He goes, so, so, and I go, computer scientists, because etching is used to make computer chips and all kinds of new electronics, one of the questions is what happens at the interface where an etching beam uh, hits the surface that it etches? And, and through uh, uh, an analysis uh, and a scientific uh, uh, pursuit of understanding what happens, the computer scientists came up with an interesting fact. At the interface where a beam etches the surface, there's the spontaneous formation of a fractal geometry. And all of a sudden, it's, oh my God, that's the interface where the, where the organic chemistry is being created as these mobile particles compared to the inorganic chemistry. And what? They're in a field, and the, they complement the field. So uh, it's interesting. The shape of things on this planet are predetermined, in a sense, by an energy field. And then evolution takes place as the particles that are being etched over time accommodate the, the geometry of the field and manifest a fractal nature. So it's interesting that... Um, that there's like a creation and an evolution at a simultaneous experience. That the field, the, the uh, fractal geometry field, is, is an energy field which shapes things, and then the creation of the particles represent the matter that then can conform to the field, and in the, in, for, in the process of conforming, that matter expresses what is called evolution. So there is a creation and an evolution simultaneously going on, which hopefully will stop the argument <laughs> between the two polarized hmm. sides that really don't like each other. The fact is, consider that both occurred at the same time. Bruce, you mention a lot in your works uh, the work of the late uh, Cleve Baxter. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, just a great guy. He used to work with the CIA, and then he went into testing plants with a polygraph system of his, and he was able to prove that plants have emotion, maybe extrasensory perception, uh, just incredible work. What do you think of that? Well, this is a, one of the most interesting aspects, is that every organism has awareness. It's also aware of other organisms that have awareness. And there's a tendency for a lower organism to key into a higher organism uh, and, and read off of that, because the higher organism has more awareness to it. And so that... All organisms are connected to each other. They're all connected by vibration because it's quantum mechanics. It, it basically, what well, we perceive of things as physical matter uh, in a quantum universe, uh, when you take that atom apart that makes up things, it, it's only vortices of energy. Uh, so that all of the energy is connected, whether it's a plant form or an animal form or whatever it is. Uh, energy is life, and this becomes very important in the understanding because uh, when we have energy, we've got life. We run out of energy, we run out of life. And, and so the first level of communication of the most primitive organism all the way up to the top organism now, the first level of communication is vibration because it represents energy. And the significance about that is when energy interacts in the field, it becomes what is called entangled. 
And energy uh, waves, which are just like waves on, on the sea, uh, when they, they come together, the waves can enhance each other or cancel each other out. It's called when, the, when, the wave, when two waves come together and the resulting uh, interaction leads to a bigger wave, that's called constructive interference. It's constructing. Uh, but for most of us, I say, well, you experience that in your life, but it's called good vibes. Uh, and I say, and sometimes two uh, waves come together and they cancel each other out. They go flat, and that's called destructive interference, but it's also called bad vibes. I say, well, why is this a primary communication? The answer is energy is equal to life. When you're in a place of good vibes, your biology is telling you, okay, you're in a place that enhances your life. You have more energy. If you find yourself feeling weak or flat or loss of energy, uh, which we refer to as bad vibes, what is it saying? It's saying where you are in the environment, the energy doesn't support your vitality that reading this is like get out of this area uh, because that, hmm. uh, uh, why is this important? Because you don't have to teach animals, okay, this is a good thing or this is a bad thing, and don't go here and don't go there. Animals know. How do they know? They just read the vibes. If the vibes are good, that's where they go, and if the vibes are bad, they go away from that. Yeah. And, and so this is the primal communication that holds it together. So plants read vibes. Animals read vibes. When, uh, if, uh, and this is what, when you have a pet dog, for example. They're, they're classic. What do they learn as puppies? They learn to read your vibes, the owner's vibes. Yeah, and they're very good. Bruce, stay with us. We're going to come back. We're already at the top of the hour. We'll pick up where we left off. Plus, I want to get into some of your other works, The Honeymoon Effect, incredible work there, too. I'm George Norrie, back in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. Fascinating discussion tonight with Dr. Bruce Lipton. And we're going to come back and chat a little bit more. Later on tonight, we'll take your phone calls as well here on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back with Dr. Bruce Lipton, the cell biologist. Bruce, I want to get into the honeymoon effect, but do cells feel pain, in your opinion? They, they feel what uh, we learn to experience as pain. They feel a chemical imbalance, an energetic imbalance, so that they know if they're in a good place or a bad place by the energy uh, inside, the, inside the cell. Remember, energy is life. They can read mm-hmm. that. But they also biochemically uh, w- will not operate or perform very well. When you put 50 trillion cells together and you put a system to monitor that, like a gauge on the dashboard, then we get the feelings as, as the, the effect of the whole community. But every cell is experiencing its own, its own real-life experiences, uh, and yet we can collectively talk to them because when they're having those experiences, the emotional chemicals are, uh, are eliciting a, a sensory response in us that corresponds to what they're experiencing. So the cells talk to us. Do they show emotion? Well, yeah. <laughs> because you, you <laughs> think of a cell they, they as a... Li- the difference, they know the difference between love and fear. That, uh, that's really important because uh, huh. uh, they, they behave quite differently uh, in a protective mode versus what, is, what I refer to as a growth mode. Uh, and, and they can't do both at the same time, which is real interesting. So by monitoring the cell, you can see uh, if, it's, if it's in a growth phase, which means it's in harmony with its environment, uh, it has a completely different expression than uh, the same cell in an environment that threatens them. Uh, they have a completely different biology going on, and the two can't be done at the same time, which is interesting. That's why our cells are either in growth or they're in protection but they can't be in both at the same time. The honeymoon effect. Tell us about that. Well, the honeymoon effect is interesting is, is that uh, you, uh, most everybody, I, I presume even you, George, <laughs> has fallen in love several times uh, during your wonderful life. Uh, uh, sure. uh, and if I say, well, you know, what are the characteristics of falling in love? And uh, uh, one of the characteristics is no matter how much your life sucks <laughs> to a certain moment when you meet this person, and all of a sudden, it's like, oh, my God, life is so beautiful. Uh, <laughs> there are three characteristics uh, that happen when people fall in love. Number one is um, they have a tendency to become extremely healthy at that point. They're, they're vibrant. They glow. People say, oh, look, look, those people in love, you can see how they're glowing and how healthy they are. That is a chemical consequence of a mind releasing uh, the, those wonderful chemicals when you fall in love. So your life sucks, and all of a sudden you meet this person, and guess what? Now you're really healthy. 
And when it comes to energy, that's always a joke in my lecture because I always say, yeah, come on, tell me you, you didn't have energy. You, you made love for days without stopping for food or sleep when you first fell in love like that. Uh, so you get abundant energy. And then the third characteristic of falling in love, and this is what I refer to as the honeymoon effect, is that life is so beautiful at that time that you can't wait to wake up the next day and have more of that wonderful life experience. So you essentially created heaven on earth. And I go, well, wait a minute. Uh, your life sucked, you meet this person, and for the next little period of time, it's like, oh my God, it's a completely different life. It's just all, it's all different. I go, well, wh what, was the, what was the whole underlying reason for this difference? The answer is this, that when we're having our regular life, 95% of our behavior is controlled by programs in the subconscious mind, uh, and most of these programs we acquire from other people, our, our parents, our family, right. our community. So 95% of our normal everyday life is actually not even based on what you want out of life. You're just running programs that you got from other people. Uh, and, and then the moment you fall in love, science has now revealed that it is the first time that you become mindful, meaning uh, you don't default to subconscious programming like you do every day, 95% of the time. You stay mindful, which means you're, you're, you don't default to the program. You're out of the program. It's like taking a red pill. I say, well, what happens when you're out of that program? And the answer is, well, the conscious mind's function is creative, and it has wishes and desires. So when you switch, when you fall in love, you... you don't default to the subconscious program anymore at that moment. You stay in the conscious mind, mindful, and then your cognitive behavior in your life is really controlled by your wishes and your desires. I go, look what, look what you did. The moment you let go of the program, taking the red pill, falling in love, is the moment you manifest heaven on earth. Uh, and I say, well, the problem with the honeymoon is that they usually don't last that long. And I go, so what causes the honeymoon to end? And the fact is, at some point, you really have to deal with life again. No matter how much you're in love, you still have a job. You've got to take care of your chores. That's right. whatever. And then I go, well, what's the relevance of that? I say, that's when we start thinking with a conscious mind. It's starting to think about the things you're going to do and all that. And I go, so what, what does that mean? That's why we default to subconscious programs, because the moment the conscious mind is thinking... It's not paying attention. So I, I, I say, uh, hey, George, what are you doing next Friday at 4 o'clock? If you actually stop to answer that question, you have to realize you have to let go of the current moment, go in your head in some Rolodex, mm -hmm. go in there and find out what you're doing. I go, yeah, but guess what? The moment you were thinking, you stopped paying attention. And if you're thinking, it doesn't mean if, let's say, you're walking and you have a thought, you just stop until the thought's completed, or you're driving the car and you have a thought. Uh, you don't, you know, crash the car. I say, well, well, what happened when you have a thought? And the answer is, when your conscious mind is thinking, you automatically run programs through the default subconscious, which has programs, but mainly derived from other people. Uh, and so the relevance is that... As long as we stay mindful, we run our lives with our wishes and desires. But the moment our minds get busy and start thinking, we start to default, and the behaviors that come out of that subconscious program are, are not the best ones in the world. And, and you didn't play them when you fell in love, because when you first fell in love, you didn't play any of the subconscious programs. And you just played from this wishes, desires mind. Then you get busy, and when you start to get busy and you start thinking a lot, you automatically play these programs from the subconscious, and psychologists will tell us most of these programs, which we got before age seven, are disempowering and self-sabotaging and limiting. So no wonder uh, that we struggle with our lives because we spend most of it running it with these programs. And, and, and the last thing, i just close it, is that you say, well, if I was playing bad programs, I'd be aware of it. And I go, no, I see, that's the problem. The reason you play these programs from the subconscious mind is because the conscious mind is busy. So when it's busy, it's not paying attention to the default programs, which then turn out to be self-sabotaging. So we wake up in the morning, conscious wishes and desires. I'm going out to create the most wonderful life, heaven on earth. I'm going to find romance, have a great job. All these are wishes. That's great. I go, yeah, but once you get out on the street, you're operating from 95% from these programs. Uh, and the most important lesson I can leave you with is the, the lesson I give in my lectures. And I go, um, I'm sure that if you go back to uh, an earlier time, you were close to a friend, 
you knew your friend's behavior very, very well, and you happen to know your friend's parent. And one day that you, you see that your friend has the same behavior as their parent. You get real excited. You want to tell them, you go, hey, you know, Bill, you're just like your dad. And then you back away from Bill because he goes ballistic and says, how the heck can you compare me to my dad? Most everybody laughs because they all have the experience. I go, sure. Most profound thing I can tell you is that's how profound this one story is. It's like everybody else can see that Bill behaves like his dad. The only one who doesn't see it is Bill. I go, explain that. And the answer is simple. He downloaded these behaviors by observing his father for the first seven years. And then 95% of his life, while his mind's thinking, he's playing these programs, but he's the one that doesn't see it. And, and, and I say, well, what is the meaning of this? And the whole idea comes down to this. We have a tendency to perceive ourselves as victims in a world where we try to acquire a goal or an end or what we're looking for, and then we struggle to get there. And, and our belief system is set like, oh, well, listen, I have great wishes and desires and beliefs to be successful. It's not working. Therefore, I am a victim of circumstances, of nature, of fate. And it turns out, oh, my God, it wasn't that way at all. It was a victim of our unconscious behaviors that were programmed by other people. And, and so when you fall in love, it's the first time. It's like taking a red pill. What is it like to live without the program? And the answer is, Oh, my God, you created heaven on earth. And then once you get back into the program, it turns back into that regular life again. It's like taking the blue pill. You're back. Same old life again. And, and the issue is we perceive ourselves as victims, and yet we are actually the masters that are creating all of this. What is it, Bruce, about the cell system that allows you to like someone, not like someone, but, you know, want someone with a certain hair color. What does that? The, okay, we go back to the quantum physics and recognize that uh, every characteristic is a vibration. A human is a complex of vibrations of, of who they are. We can feel that when we own it. You can get next to somebody and you can feel that because their energy is, is vibrating out all the time. Uh, and as I said, we communicate as the primary level of reading those vibes as good vibes or bad vibes. And good vibes are vibrations that come from, uh, it doesn't have to be a person, it could be any object. That's what feng shui is all about. You're moving objects and actually creating vibration crystals. That we read the vibrations. And if someone has a vibration that's in harmony with you, then you can feel that when you get next to them. That's that good vibe. It's nature's way of telling you this person is in harmony with you supports who you are versus getting next to somebody else where you feel the energy sort of disappearing or it doesn't feel right, bad vibes. And, and what that signal is, this person is not in harmony with you. This is, this is essentially the full extent is a predator-prey relationship. And it's unfortunate because we have been programmed not to go by our feelings. Uh, you know, growing up, it's sort of like, well, don't, don't go by your feelings. Listen to what the person has to say. And I go, biggest mistake, biggest mistake. The first communication is vibration. And when you understand that vibration, it will guide you successfully through the world. When you ignore the vibration, you're open for, for predator-prey relationships, in fact. That's where it comes down to. So what attracts you is, is a vibration, a harmony. That's something between their consciousness. Remember, their brain activity is not contained in their head. It's broadcast like a tuning fork. And when you read that, you can find out, uh, are they in harmony with you with their energy or not? How would you know? Because your energy and their energy entangle, and it either enhances your energy or reduces your energy. And that is the ultimate uh, factor that you should consider in, in, in making any kind of relationship or action, is how that energy feels. What fascinates you the most, Bruce, about this work that you do and what's out there in this science? I mean, to tie in, you know, the cell structure with consciousness, it's amazing, isn't it? It's always exciting to me. I mean, I, I've been doing this for, I got 40 years now, George, you know, and I'm still excited by it every day because we are living something that was revealed 
when you understand, if you can talk to the cells and watch them and listen to them, not tell them what to do, but observe what they do, then you can see we're in a very interesting plan. We're in a pattern. We're we're manifesting a, a, an evolutionary upheaval at this very moment, uh, and it's a pattern that plays through evolution. We have been, you know, brought up on the belief of a Darwinian based evolution, which is like a two-step process. Uh, first, there's this accidental mutation, uh, and then uh, the organism with this mutation. If the mutation benefits them, then they can pass on this mutation and pass it on to future generations. Or if that mutation uh, you know, takes away uh, the power from their life, they, that dies out and they don't pass it on. So we have a belief that evolution is result A from a random event, uh, and then B followed by whether that uh, mutation was beneficial or detrimental. Uh, So that's called natural selection. And I go, well, what's the relevance? And I say, well, when you believe that, number one, you say, well, why are we here? And then you say, oh, it was an accident. (laughs) And if it was an accident, then there was no purpose. That was really what it comes down to. Uh, And then you also say, well, how do you make the best of it? Well, that that Darwinian emphasis, which is really something from Thomas Malthus, uh, was the survival of the fittest. Uh, and so what is the caveat that we get from Darwinian evolution? Two steps. A, it's all random, and B, we're left with a, a struggle for survival, with a competition for fitness. So in our world today, we manifest that that scientific belief in our culture. We're all in competition. It's a rat race. It's dog eat dog. Go out there, take care of yourself, and, and don't worry about the other person. That's Darwinian. If they, they fail, that's their problem. This is completely wrong. <laughs> it's completely wrong because evolution is not a battleground. A garden isn't a battleground. It's a, it's a place of harmony and cooperation. And so we look at the world with our eyes adjusted through the filters of science and look at the competition and the violence and go, yeah, this is just a natural way of life. And I go, no, it's not. <laughs> the natural way of life is harmony and community. And that's what we're beginning to find out. Competition takes us away from evolution. It's cooperation that brings us into evolution. And this is what we're seeing in the world. There's an unfolding of, uh, of a new cooperation, a breaking down of barriers. Uh, the, the development of the, uh, of the Internet was like the final evolutionary phase of this new system called humanity. I say, what, what's humanity? It's a, it's a super organism that's forming. And I go, yeah, what's it made out of? I say, it's made out of cells, but the cells are called people. You and I and everyone on this, on this line right now, we are cells in the body of something that's forming right now called humanity, where we recognize that we're all in the same body, and we have to start learning to recognize that in order to bring health and harmony to the planet, we have to have health and harmony among all the cells, the humans. That, that, are, that are here. So we're evolving, not in a Darwinian way. We're evolving into community, and that is a repetition pattern that's observed. Bacteria were the first organized, or, uh, organisms. They form communities, and what did they form? An amoeba. And I go, and what about amoeba? Well, amoebas then proliferated, and I say, what did they create? And I go, well, you. <laughs> we're 50 trillion amoebas that are in this community. And I say, and then what happened is the human reaches its fullest evolution, just like the amoeba did and the bacterium did. And then I say, well, then what? Well, just like the bacterium, just like the amoeba, the humans are now coming together to create the superorganism. And when we understand that harmony, that will bring balance and peace into this world that has been driven by a mistake in belief that it's all based on competition and survival of the fittest and screw the ones that lose. Uh, this is this is detrimental, and 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 we're seeing it play itself out right now, and, and it's interesting because um, the millennial generation, the listeners on this line, are all part of a civilization that says this isn't working, and we need something different, and that's when we step outside, and that's where the evolution is coming from right now. What do you think consciousness truly is? What is it? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I took it down to the <laughs> to the fundamental understanding of it. Basically, first, it's just simple awareness that something exists and that you are aware of it. So I say, well, then bacteria have consciousness. Of course they do. They, they know what's going on in the world, and they adjust their biology to their perceptions of what's going on. And, and then I say, well, 
where is that consciousness? How does it work? And I go, oh, well, that was the cool part about the work on cells. Because built into the cell membrane, which is uh, 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 it's a homolog of a computer, it's an organic carbon-based computer, uh, there are bits of data. The bits are called receptor effector proteins. They're input-outputs. And I go, those simple units are the units of awareness and consciousness. Why? The receptor reads a, the, a signal, and the protein effector transmits a response. So it's stimulus response. And, and then I go, well, that's the unit of consciousness. I go, yeah, and they're built into the membrane. And, and here comes the part that's neat. The, these units, these proteins built in the membrane can't stack up on top of each other. They're the same thickness as the membrane, so they can only form a monolayer. And you say, well, what's the relevance? I go, aha, the more protein receptors that you have for this awareness means you have more surface area. There's a direct mathematics now of consciousness is related to surface area. The more surface area you have, the more intelligence you have. And, and this is what's driving evolution. The, the bacterium reached a certain size membrane, couldn't get any smarter. What does it do? Join in community so that a community of bacteria could share their surface areas. And I say, then what? Well, they formed an amoeba, which has thousands of times more surface area than a bacterium. And I say, what did they do? Well, these communities of bacteria called amoebas, then they come together and form bigger communities like a human by sharing surface area. Bruce, when we come back, I want to talk about disease and how our bodies, through our mind, can fight it. And, of course, our special guest tonight, Dr. Bruce Lipton, as we're talking about his incredible work as you tie in cells and consciousness. Have you had a chance yet to watch our television program, Beyond Belief? Well, please take a look at that by going to this website, beyondbelief.com, uh, you could sign up to watch it, uh, watch them all. Just watch a few, do whatever you want to do, but it's a fun show. Beyondbelief.com. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you along with Dr. Bruce Lipton. We're going to take your calls next hour. Bruce, why does it seem that the placebo effect, uh, giving someone uh, something that just isn't the real medication, for example, but a test, seems to work? <laughs> that seems to it. It definitely works. And <laughs> not discussed very much by the pharmaceutical industry. No. Uh, uh, and the fact is simply, what is it? It's like, well, we, we talked about the fact that uh, the, the blood in the body, the chemistry of the blood, controls the genetics and the behavior. And then we went go back to the mind, and I say, oh, well, the mind is controlling the chemistry. So when you're having a positive thought uh, about uh, a drug or, uh, or therapeutic treatment of some kind, that this is going to affect you, that positive thinking is what releases the chemistry that controls the genetics and the behavior of the cell. So that there wasn't the drug, which could be a sugar pill or, or the fake surgery. It wasn't, it wasn't that. It was the belief in it because the belief is translated into chemistry by the brain, which then goes into the culture medium. And, and then through that definition, the com chemical composition of the culture medium is what selects the genetic activity and can modify that genetic activity. So uh, the, the positive thinking placebo effect, almost everyone's aware of, and I say, well, the biggest problem is that the public is not aware of what is called the nocebo effect. Uh, and I say, what's that? And I go, well, we've been talking about placebo where positive thought of healing is associated with this drug, which turns out to be a sugar pill, and the positive thought of healing generates the healing because of the chemistry that comes from that. And then I say, yeah, and the nocebo effect is, what is the consequence of a negative thought, that this won't mm -hmm. work or this can't be done? And the thing is, it's equally powerful in its behavior on biology. So as much as the placebo can heal you from a cancer, let's say, a negative thought can create the cancer and create death. Uh, and we never really talk about it. And it's significant because psychologists will tell us 70% of our thoughts are negative and redundant anyway. So we are continuously using uh, our con unconscious and conscious mind without knowing it, uh, sabotaging our biology with negative beliefs. Uh, and, and this is where most of the health issues come from. We used to say, well, the genes cause all these things, and, but now we know that less than 1% of disease comes from genes. And, and therefore, it's really coming from how you're interacting with the world, 
which is adjusting your, your blood culture medium, which then in turn is adjusting your genetics. And that's fascinating. Negativity has this opposite effect on people. I guess that's what they say stress can kill you, too. Same kind of thing? Absolutely. And, and that's where the, it's now recognized that up to 90% of doctor visits are due to stress. Nothing, uh, is, uh, we keep blaming, oh, the body is frail, the body is vulnerable. It's like, that is so untrue. Uh, the fact is, it's stress that does it. And, and, and there's a simple reason. There's, there's two characteristics that, remember I said the mind will interpret the environment, and if it's a stressful environment, it will release the uh, hormones to control the adrenal glands, which lead, lead the stress hormones into the body. And I go, well, there's two consequences of this that are, are just so straight forward, responsible for almost all the illness on this planet. And the two consequences are this. When stress hormones are released into the body, uh, and this is what it says in the textbook, it's a little ambiguous, so I'm going to explain it. It says, when stress hormones are released into the body, the blood is preferentially sent to the arms and legs. Okay, so what does that mean? It's simply this. If you're getting a stress hormone, that's a threat from the outside. There's an environmental something threatening you, mm -hmm. and in the case of a threat, we activate the adrenal system, fight or flight. And I said, well, yeah, because you're going to use your arms and legs to run or fight. And so you preferentially send the blood to, to the arms and legs. And I go, yeah, well, that's because there's more energy now for fight or flight. And I go, yeah, but where was it before it was <laughs> sent to the arms and legs? And the answer is, well, it was in the viscera, the gut. I go, what's the significance? I go, well, the organs in the viscera are all the organs used to maintain the body's biology and its health and its growth, and, and it handles all the, the fluids and, and, and manages maintenance of the body. So it takes energy to do that. That's why blood is in the gut, and blood delivers energy so we can maintain our bodies healthfully and grow. And, I say, and then when you get stressed and stress hormones are released, they cause the blood vessels in the gut to constrict. That's when you feel butterflies in the gut, when you feel all of a sudden like a little out of balance and there's this like right. fluttering. Uh, that's actually stress hormones squeezing blood vessels in the gut, and that fluttering is the blood vessel shutting, and that causes the blood to be pushed to the arms and legs. You go, yeah, if I'm going to run away from a saber-toothed tiger, man, that's what I want all the energy in my arms and legs because I'm going to run away from it. And I go, well, this uh, at the expense of what? And I say, well we got all the blood in the arms and legs by taking it out of the gut, but the gut was health and growth and maintenance of the body. I go, you know, 100,000 years ago, this was a great design. Why? A saber-toothed tiger comes, you, you see this, you release the stress hormones, you pump the blood into the arms and legs, and you run like hell, and you get away ultimately from, from that, that saber-toothed tiger, and then what? You go back into growth again. The stress hormones stop and then the blood returns to the growth and maintenance of the body. And I go, and what about today? And I go, that's the problem. Because it was just running away from the saber-toothed tiger and then recovering. That was it. But today, stress is 24-7, 365. We are continuously releasing stress hormones. I go, yeah, what's the consequence? You are continuously impairing the health maintenance of the body. And, and that means that you are now opening yourself for breakdown. Uh, why? Because you've been putting all this blood in your arms and legs, getting ready to run from some fear, whatever it is, and there's so many of them, uh, that we have compromised our growth. So I say, number one, we get sick just because stress hormones shut down the visceral functions, and those are the things that keep us healthy. Okay, and then I go, now, the second thing that just nails it and makes it worse is there are two protection systems. The adrenal system, run away from a saber-toothed tiger. The immune system, ah, protect you from things that get under your skin, viruses, bacteria, parasites. I go, and significance? Well, the immune system uses a tremendous amount of energy when it's working. Uh, how do you know? And I say, well, have you ever been sick <laughs> and feel how tired you got? Is why? Because you're redirecting the energy to the immune system, which is a big-time energy user. And I go, okay, uh, here's a theoretical job. Uh, you're in charge of energy distribution in the body. There's a little office in your brain. You go to work on Monday morning, and at, your, at the desk, the phone rings, and it's the stomach calling, and it says, listen, we've got a bacterial infection down here, and how much energy can you send us down here to you know, take care of the bacteria? 
So you hang up the phone, you try to do a calculation, and just as you're doing that, the phone rings, and a more frantic voice says, we're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger. How much energy can you send? And I say, hmm. okay, you're in charge. How much energy are you going to put in to fight that bacteria? How much energy are you going to use to run away from the tiger? Uh, I hope the answer is 100% of the energy to run away from the tiger for a simple reason. If the tiger catches you, the bacteria are no longer a problem, actually, at that point. So what's the, the, the conclusion of this is very simple. If the threat is from the outside world and stress hormones are released into the body to prepare us for fight or flight, the same stress hormones shut off the immune system. And in fact, it's so powerful that when doctors are transplanting an organ into a recipient and they don't want that, that recipient's immune system to reject that organ right away, they give the recipient, along with the transplant, stress hormones. And that inhibits the immune system from rejecting the foreign tissue. I go, yeah, but if you're a normal person, you're out on the street, and you're living under the stress all day, you've now shut down the growth and maintenance of the body, and then on top of that, guess what you did? You shut down the immune system because you're conserving that energy to run from that proverbial tiger or whatever it is you're fearing. I say, so what is the result? Simple. Stress shuts down the maintenance and, and caring of the body and the growth sure and does. repair of the body. And number two, stress shuts down the immune system, which protects you from uh, infection, inflammation, and all that stuff. And I say, well, there's only one result from that, and that is illness and disease. And that's what stress causes. Let's talk a little bit about intention, Bruce, and how it can alter events, change things, change weather patterns. How in the heck does that work? <laughs> Well, there are many levels we have to start <laughs> with, uh, you know, and, uh, and you really have had some very profound physicists talk about it. So the first thing is recognizing that what they knew even back in 1930 when quantum physics was first revealed to the public, it was reported by those founding fathers of that science that, that it was consciousness that is creating the world in which we live. Uh, I mean, it was just a clear fact that uh, I remember Eddington's uh, quote was, uh, rather than looking uh, like a giant machine, the universe is looking more like a giant thought. Uh, and so consciousness, and even um, uh, Stephen Hawking uh, recently, uh, well, a couple of years back now, uh, published a paper uh, that said that consciousness, human consciousness is affecting the, the uh, cosmology that, that, we, that we study the universe with. So there's a underlying quantum physics thing here about consciousness and how that, that uh, affects uh, things at that level. Uh, and then there's a biological level of consciousness that controls your genetics. And, and this is important. Mm -hmm. You can meditate for eight hours and change, change your genes. They've found that two fundamental genes that control inflammation can be completely altered by eight hours of meditation. Uh, um, Dean Ornish in San Francisco studying prostate cancer, he, he took his men and put them into two groups. One got the conventional pharmaceutical treatment for prostate cancer, and the other group for 90 days, both groups 90 days, the other group got no medication. What did they get? They got um, uh, stress reduction techniques, uh, techniques how to meditate, and they changed their diet. And, and what a gutsy experiment, too, because, I mean, you're taking a chance, aren't you? Well, that's, what, that's why it was a, only a 90-day experiment, and uh, the prostate cancer isn't a fast-growing thing, so they had an opportunity to, ah, to read reverse the it. genetics before. That was important. They read the genetics uh, of the patients before the 90 days and then read it after 90 days. Over 500 genes changed their complete function just by changing diet and, and doing meditation uh, exercises. That's amazing. It really is. But something we believed... Uh, you know, for years, Bruce, that you have the ability to change things, to alter things. Um, we have, and, and people do that, and then we discount it because try to explain that with your conventional biomedical science, and the answer is there is no explanation. So what does science do? Oh, no explanation? Metaphysics. <laughs> we can't deal with it. And, and, and unfortunately, they, they, they kept throwing things out they can't deal with, but now... Those things they can't deal with are, are a mountain, and, 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 but they resolve when we understand a whole new biology, which is not based on Newtonian physics, matter physics. It's based on quantum 
mechanics. It's on energy physics. And this is changes every aspect because everything up to now is you want to affect the body, it's physical, then do something physical to it. The new understanding is you want to change the body. Ah, do something with energy. <laughs> energy will change it, uh, you know, significantly. Actually, in, in, it's been studied uh, in biophysics. Now, what's the difference or uh, influence of an energy signal as a communication versus a chemical, like a drug signal for communication? And the answer is energy signals are 100 times more efficient and infinitely faster than chemical signals. Relevant? Biology sure. is actually using the energy, uh, and we're just moving into this new understanding of, uh, of quantum biophysics. Then all of a sudden, mind, which was an energy which was completely left out of science, because science says uh, we only study the material world, what we can measure, weigh, and do all that stuff. Well, mind is energy, can't do anything with it. So it was by convention, mind is not used in a scientific study. Except now, the whole thing is coming back where mind is an energy field, and uh, and Einstein's quote, which is profoundly important and again simple, like he makes them is that the field, the energy, the field is the sole governing agency of the particle. It, what he was saying was just straightforward. The field, the energy, is the governing agency of matter. And all of a sudden, that mind, which you've left out of science for 200 years, turns out uh, to be the most important factor in controlling our biology. It changes our genetics uh, with, with the mind. We actually can, a gene is a blueprint. Let's just simplify first. A gene is a blueprint to make a protein, which is a building block of the body. The body is a protein assembly with 100,000 different proteins. And a gene is a blueprint to make a protein. So when the Human Genome Project was getting off the ground, the scientists at first said, oh, they're going to find over 100,000 genes. Why? You need a gene to make a protein or 100,000 proteins. So they started the project with the, they're going to find 100,000 genes, and what did they end up with? 19,000 genes. And that's the same number of genes as in a microscopic worm they use in genetic research. Right. There's only 1,200,000. <laughs> I go, so what's the relevance? And it says, oh, how do you make 100,000 proteins with 19,000 genes? And all of a sudden, it's, oh, my God. The system can take a gene, a blueprint. It's, it's, it's just like a strip of letters. And take a pair of scissors and cut it in different ways and reattach them in different patterns. It's like cut and paste. And so I can, uh, I can make 3,000 different proteins from one gene blueprint by cutting and pasting it. And I go, what's the relevance? And the answer is, since our consciousness is involved with the cutting and the pasting, it turns out that we modify our genes to the extent that cancer is less than 10% heredity-based at all, less than 10%. 90% of cancer, people rewriting their genes through the way they're living their lives out of harmony and not in balance. And we've been blaming the genes. It was like, no, we're the ones using it. It's called epigenetics, and it's, it's a mechanism by which the environment and your perception of the environment can rewrite your genetics. And you can create 3,000 variations of every gene. And all of a sudden you start to say, oh, my God, we blame the, our issues on body frailty. And it turns out, oh, no, it's the most powerful thing in the world. It's the mind where frailty is coming from. It's the mind that can take a normal gene and cause it to become a cancer gene. Bruce, how come some people are lucky and other people aren't? Well, uh, the whole idea is, what do you, it's sort of like, the, the again, the honeymoon effect, which is lucky for some people when they get there and other people don't get it. And, and, and not for others, that's right. Uh, that's it. And, and what is it? And the answer is this. Remember the concept of the tuning fork. Your mind is a tuning fork. It is broadcasting frequencies. I can read them outside your head. I go, why is that relevant? I go, okay. The, uh, people are familiar with the concept that a vocalist can reach a certain note and cause crystal glass goblets to break and mirrors to break and stuff like that. Everyone's familiar with that, and that's what? It's called harmonic resonance. When you send out a vibration, anything that's in harmony with that vibration will move with it. 
when you sound out a vibration and there's something out in the field with a completely different vibration, that other thing will not respond at all. So a, a tuning fork will cause only those things that are in harmony with that vibration to move. And I go, well, relevant, your brain is a tuning fork. Your thoughts are vibrations. Your thoughts are going out into the field. And what are they going to do? They're going to resonate with the things that are in harmony with them, and they're going to have no influence on anything that's not in harmony with them. Then I say, ah, oh, then what happens to your life was not an accident. It wasn't a coincidence. You were involved with, a, a, with an energy interaction to activate those things that are in harmony with your thoughts. And if your thoughts are not in harmony, then what moves out there is not in harmony. And, and this is the issue that, that our programming has really given us so many negative beliefs about ourselves. It's almost, you know, I forgot what large percentage of negative programs that we got, is that then what are we broadcasting most of us in our lives? We're broadcasting this negative vibration that only causes negative things that are in harmony with it to move. So what happens in your life wasn't an accident. It was a harmonic resonance. Hmm. And, and, and this is why what happens when, when you fall in love. We go back to the honeymoon for, and I say, ah, you stop playing the program, and guess what? Now you're playing wishes and desires. That is a completely different vibration than the negative Bruce, programming. Bruce, when we come back, I want to ask you if we're getting help from someone up there whenever this occurs. Dr. Bruce Lipton with us, and when we come back in a moment, we'll also take your phone calls. And we're with Dr. Bruce Lipton as we talk about science, biology, cell structure, consciousness. We've got it all for you tonight on Coast to Coast AM, and when we come back, we'll take your calls as well. And welcome back. Dr. Bruce Lipton with us. We'll get to your calls as well. Bruce, some people would call them spirit guides, helpers. Others would call them angels. Do they, in your opinion, help out in any of this? In my my guess opinion, my personal opinion, yes. And, and I say that for a very simple reason. First, own that we are not in these bodies, that we are part of an energy field, that every one of us is out there in the energy field, and there are more out there in the field than there are in bodies right now. Relevance is, if you're within the body, then you deal with people on this plane within the body. But when we get out of body and we have those intuitive experience out of body, the near-death experiences, things like that, that transcend the, our body level, we we start to communicate at a different level. And that communication level out of the body is an entire field of all information for, for eons. And when we tap into that, that's where we really bring new ideas into this planet. They're not necessarily new ideas. They're from the awareness that's out there. So if I'm an entity that's out there and I have awareness and all the other entities that are out there that have awareness, then um, um, cooperation communication uh, and uh, activities together uh, with the energies would make total possible sense for sure. I'm, I'm an energy. There, all the other energies are there. And, and since uh, the other energies, like myself, have awareness, communication that can occur at another level that's not in the body plane. Is all of this electrical as well, Bruce? You know, we are an electric body. But the, 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 the other side, the consciousness part of it, is it all part of some kind of energy, electrical energy system? Well, at some level, there's, there's some part of that for a very simple reason. The only reason I say that is uh, from understanding the nature of how the environmental signals cross into the body. To do that, to have an, a signal then manifest an expression within the body, you have to um, affect the proteins. And proteins are, are interesting molecules. They're very complex shapes. But when there's a change in the energy field, which can be electromagnetic or quantum uh, changes, uh, entanglement, uh, uh, quantum uh, uh, making holes through things with, with, with quantum particles, um, they affect the, the proteins the same in a similar way, so that the proteins are like receptors, some of them. They're like antennas. They respond to environmental signals. But to do that, there's an energy shift in the protein that causes the protein to change its shape. That's where life comes from. That's a, the bottom principle of life. We're made out of proteins, and proteins can respond to environmental signals by changing shape, 
And that changing of shape is movement, which is what creates life. So uh, the idea is that there must be an energy field influence on a receptor somewhere in the cell in order to translate that information that's in the field into biology. So there's, and what we know right now is uh, electromagnetic fields and quantum tunneling and, and quantum entanglement are elements that uh, that cause the proteins to change shape and generate life. So, uh, yeah, that would that that certainly shows how an interface of uh, information uh, in the field can be translated into biology by changing these proteins. It's important to recognize when uh, because when we talk about energy. Uh, there, there's two aspects of energy. It's almost like apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. uh, one aspect of energy is force. It forces, it moves things. It's got you know power and stuff like that. Another aspect is energy, uh, is information. Uh, and it may not have very much force at all, but it has a lot of information, like cell phones, television broadcasts, uh, this this radio broadcast. Uh, it's not physical enough to cause a lot of force, but it carries information. So when we're talking about translating energy, we really have to recognize, well, there's two, two expressions of that energy, a force form and information, and the proteins in the cells will respond to both of those. And as a result, uh, this is what connects us to the field, but it also connects how your identity affects your cells and does not affect the person sitting next to you, their cells, is because each of us is, has proteins that are in harmony with the individual frequencies that we represent. I, I don't know if I made anything complicated, George, but I was trying to simplify. No, you did well. Why is it that some people have these innate abilities to tap into all this, and other people just can't do it? Well, a lot of it is programming. I mean, everything is everything that the, these really interesting people who, who are, you know, mentalists and people who can uh, uh, do all, you know, move things with their mind and change things like that. They acknowledge everybody can do this. It's just that they have a background and a cultural support to encourage that belief and to encourage practice in that belief. And most of us come from uh, cultures that look at those kind of things as too weird, and if you do it as a kid, you're almost like, no, don't do that in public. You know, don't, don't, don't let people see you do these things. So we put it away, fail to use it. And everything in our biology, from muscles to brain, uh, everything in between, is based on use it or lose it. When we stop using our, our, our biology to read these signals and respond to them, it's not that we can't do it, but... Uh, it's like a muscle that's not exercised. It's not going to work very well. And most of us have been programmed not to use this vital information. And then again, there are the exceptions. The one you say that their programs encourage them to use it. And uh, they're no genetically different uh, between us. It's just programming. All right, let's go to the phones now. Alex will get us started in Portland, Oregon. Hello, Alex. Thanks. Hey, guys. How's it going? Good. Hi, Alex. So, Dr. Lipton, I was uh, I was wondering. There's a there's a book and also a documentary by the same title um, about DMT. I think it's dim dimethyltryptamine. Um, it's a very powerful uh, hallucinogen, psychedelic sort of chemical. And um, I've seen the documentary. And uh, and uh, if you're familiar with the work of Terence McKenna, he also right. wrote and spoke a lot about it. Now, none of the none of the people there. It was a study done. Um, uh, basically observing the effects of, of DMT when absorbed intravenously. And uh, what a lot of these people described, no one, to my memory, specifically came to the uh, conclusion that I sort of did. Excuse me, came to the conclusion what, Alex? Well, I, is that you, Bruce? I hear no, a lot uh, of uh, scratching. Alex disappeared. I was listening, and then he, he said something, and then it got fuzzy. Yeah, he is did. He cutting out? There you go, Alex. Okay, can again. everybody hear me? Yep. Yeah, now I right. just, just go over the last point. So, uh, basically, it was a study done with DMT taken intravenously, um, and uh, what a lot of the people, the participants in this study described sounded an awful lot to me, the, their, the sort of place they were taken to, uh, what they, I mean, a complete sort of removal from reality. Their description of what they saw sounded to me like what a person would see if they were somehow shrunk down and stuffed inside of a cell. 
And I mean, just uh, ribosomes and the nucleus and things floating around, and then also very much more of a spiritual experience, uh, insights about life and the universe and themselves that were sort of in, uh, imprinted on them through this experience. Now, uh, what my question is, is that could there be a possibility that not only are this, this idea of the intelligence at the cellular, cellular level, the sort of universe experiencing itself through life, uh, biology, um, is it possible that maybe these people were uh, communicating um, with that cellular intelligence? And uh, this is a great program. The segment before this was awesome. Uh, I'll take my answer off the air. Thanks a lot for having me. Well, you got it. Thank you, Thank Alex. You uh, I, I have to say, you know, very interestingly, uh, um, I, I personally had my own inner body experience, and and, uh, uh, and it was interesting because the the next day when I was, re, you know, recounting everything that happened, and I said to myself, oh, well, this is all, you know, I just took everything I learned from electron microscopy and traveling through the cells, and, and, and I just animated it. And there was something really exciting about it, though. The, the one thing that was so exciting was when uh, I, I was looking outside of a capillary and looking at my cells, and it looked like a giant laser show. And that was the thing that was like, whoa, wow, this is so tremendous. And, I, and, when, and the next day when I was going over, I thought, well, yeah, I, you know, I took my ideas that I knew about cells and then just put a little imagination in there, but then found out two years later from Russian research that uh, the obvious thing, every time an electron is passed from one atom to another atom, it gives off a photon of light. And since the biology is based on things called the electron chain transport, which is electrons moving all over, I actually saw something that I didn't know existed. So for me, it was like, oh, my God, I was actually there. So I think our consciousness level goes down to the cell if you want to go there. Uh, and then, of course, those other people take it to the complete other direction. Since consciousness would be a field of energy that permeates everything, uh, where you focus is, is real interesting. And the DMT kind of stuff is interesting because it, it, it's, inter it's interacting with something that's natural, meaning, okay, you put DMT and you got it from some other source, but there's a receptor for DMT, which by definition means there must be a signal for the equivalent of DMT in our system, which would allow us to automatically transcend the physical body and move into that other energy plane. DMT is a facilitation, uh, but it, 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 as I said, uh, the receptor wasn't made for an eventual discovery of DMT. The receptor was there because we could already do that. I think it's a very interesting point now is because it's really uh, like a switch that allows us to step outside of the body and go other, and go other places. Remote viewing, George, you brought that up before. That's exactly yeah. the same thing. Remote viewing inside the cell <laughs> is, is the same kind of thing. It is amazing how it worked. Did the ancients use this, Bruce? I mean, biblical days, Jesus moments, did they use this kind of uh, power? I'll, I, and I'll call uh, it absolutely. that. Absolutely. I, I, I talked, I, I, gosh, I can't remember what, um, what religion they are. They were back with the Essenes, uh, and there's a group of them that... Uh, were on the border of Iraq and Iran, and then they got bombed by Bush, and they had to leave. And I met some of them in Australia. One of the knowledge keepers, and he—they're he, the original Baptists, and, and he was very upset with the Christians because they—they—they they, they altered the whole meaning of it. The, the original yes. Baptist was a as a traveling you, you, that people will almost be like frozen in, in physical space, and their minds are not there. They're gone. Their bodies are here. They travel into space, and they get all this information, and they come back with it. That's what baptism was all about, uh, at the edge of the water, and then uh, your, your, your spirit leaves and travels and then comes back later. So uh, this was ancient, ancient stuff, but it, it's the kind of uh, information that they share, which was things about, like, uh, uh, big bangs and all that kind of stuff, which they got from their traveling, their astral traveling with this, and this is what Jesus was apparently doing, uh, traveling and, and going out into the other realms and getting information and coming back. Let's go to a few more calls before the break. Philip is in Augusta, Maine now. Hey, Philip, thanks for calling. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, to make this simple, uh, Bruce, uh, about 15 years ago, I nearly died, and to get better, I started meditating, and what happened is that 
everywhere I went, I would trigger attacks by people, and this has been going on for 15 years. And I do certain practices that can alleviate it, but uh, now it's got to where I'm paranoid and almost reclusive. <laughs> so there we go. So, so you thing. mean that your energy field, your consciousness is, is impacting these people in a negative way that you're talking about or a positive way? or? Well, I don't. I, at first I thought, well, how could it be me? I thought maybe that it was an entity and maybe something got attached to me when I nearly died or it could be my energy level, I just have never found, uh, you know, the, the source of this. Hmm. Well, you, you absolutely are the force. You are the energy. Uh, uh, the whole body is the energy itself. I mean, uh, this is the interesting thing about why these new medical technologies like CAT scans and MRI scans and all thermo scans and all that, uh, they don't read the physical body. They're scanning an energy body. Uh, and we have to own the simple truth that we are radiating these energies. I said there's the the heart uh, is, is actually amplifying that energy that we that we radiate with our minds because it, it takes the energy of your mind uh, in coherence with the energy of the heartbeat. It's a carrier wave, so uh, you are broadcasting this this energy and your experience, which is you know one of those NDE experiences, which are profound life-changing in many ways. Uh, I can't answer what it is, but I, I have to uh, acknowledge the fact is that people's energies influence everybody else's energy. It's a, it's, it's a basis of a crowd response. How a pacifist can be in a, in a crowd like at a soccer game and there's a riot and all of a sudden the pacifist is clubbing somebody over the head with a chair. Exactly. They got carried away with the field so that there's a general field influence on all of us because we are fields. That's the first thing we have to acknowledge. That's a simple truth, and that fields interact. And if someone, you know, was receptive, complementarily wise to your energy, resonant with it, uh, obviously you can have an influence. But I, I uh, you know, I'm not saying that that's exactly what it is. But I, well, I will give a basis. There is a scientific basis for how your energy uh, influences everything around you. Bruce, how do these cells interact and understand and know? You know, what's really going on? I mean, it's like they have their own little brains. Well, every cell is intelligent. I mean, it, it can live by itself. That's when I take a cell out of the body and put it in a culture dish by itself. It, it's got its own intelligence to carry on life outside. So every cell is, is an intelligent being. And now we know that they communicate in, in two primary ways, physical ways through, like, chemi chemical or mechanical communications. Uh, but we also know now that cells, uh, you put cells inside like a glass collar and put other cells around the outside. And if you put like cancer cells inside the glass ring uh, and normal cells on the outside, that the, the energy from the cancer cells in some way penetrates through the ring and alters the behavior of the cells on the outside. Well, the first thing is this. There's no physical communication. So we're now re recognize a simple reality that there's this information transfer between cells. And you brought up cleave before, and that was an interesting uh, uh, thing because cleave's work ties a couple of things together. Uh, uh, I think you were probably familiar, George, with the, the study where he took human cells and put them in a Petri dish and moved them about 25 miles away from the person. Yeah. And, and when he elicited an emotional response in the person, at the exact same instant, 25 miles away, the, the cell, his cells out there started to have uh, electrical activity that was connected to the emotion. And you say, well, how can that happen? It's and amazing. Know, well, this is exactly the story we were talking about. The cells have receptors for identity, identities in the field. I don't care if you move the cells 25, 50 miles away. Or, or, miles or 10 away. million, or 10 or million 10, miles away. Right. They're going to respond to you. And I say, well, where are you? You're not in the body. You're broadcasting to the body. But if I take some of your cells out and move them away then the cells at a distance are going to respond at exactly the same time. Uh, this is very exciting when we understand this, what people don't really understand, is that when a, a woman is carrying a child, the placenta, uh, which is embryonic cells, implants itself into the woman's uterus. What we didn't realize until more recently is that the cells from the placenta, many of them travel into the mother's system and become her stem cells, that she carries stem cells from every child that she carries. 
And you go, well, what's the relevance of that? Well, there were studies to show that many of these stem cells from the child uh, uh, aggregate in the brain area. You go, so, so what? I go, think of Cleve Baxter's study. This is how women, uh, mothers, know when something has gone wrong with a child that is not at home, could be on the other side of the world. Their child's had an accident, and they feel it instantly. I go, how's that? And it's like, oh, it was Cleve Baxter's kind of experiment. The child's cells are in the mother's brain. The child's cells are responding to the child's broadcast. If the child has a problem, the mother is experiencing it because she's harboring those cells in her body and reads that. And that's a, a very important connection between mothers and their offspring, especially in lower organisms, which allow them to connect at distances. We're going to come back with more final calls with Dr. Bruce Lipton in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. Well, a couple little notes on ParanormalDate.com. We're looking for couples now who are meeting so we can share your stories on the program. So uh, check in with us, and if that happens, just email me at george at coast to coast AM dot com. Also, as of right now, I need 357 of you to sign up and to go visit ParanormalDate.com. That'll get us to 14,000 members already, which is a milestone, and it's going faster than anything they've ever seen. Simply go to ParanormalDate.com. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. Dr. Bruce Lipton with us. Bruce, with the power of suggestion to be able to change things, are there techniques that you would recommend for people? Oh, a- absolutely. What we're really trying to do is get people to rewrite subconscious programming. The subconscious mind is like a, a record playback device, and it learns from life experiences and teaching. Uh, and when you want to change something in your life, you really want to change a program that is preventing you from getting that. So uh, what are the fast ways of changing uh, well, the, the two conventional ways of changing subconscious is uh, the first way, uh, first seven years, the subconscious was programmed by hypnosis. So putting uh, subliminal tapes on uh, as you go to bed at night, uh, you pass through a uh, theta period with brain activity is where hypnosis is occurring, so you can download a new program, new belief. Uh, secondly, uh, after your seven, you create uh, uh, new behaviors and programs by repetition. Uh, and uh, so you can change uh, what you're, you know, you're having trouble with your life and you're looking for a change, so you create a new behavior that will bring that change in. And But at this time where we're really facing very critical times, there's uh, some very special super learning techniques that are referred to as energy psychology or belief change modification uh, systems, and these allow us to change beliefs, which is a, a suggestion. You want to put a new suggestion, I want a new belief, uh, and you can change the beliefs in the matters of about 10 minutes. Uh, I'm, on my website, I have a listing under resources uh, for uh, about 20 or 30 of these different uh, uh, modalities because they're so exciting, because we can change our lives in, in, in minutes rather than the, our, our conventional belief that it takes uh, months or you know weeks or whatever time you can actually uh, bring a suggestion in and make it part of your life in, in in less than ten minutes. All right, back to the calls we go in this last segment. Brian in Omaha, Nebraska, is with us. Hello, Brian. On with Doctor Bruce Lipton. Hi, George. Hi, Bruce. Hi, Brian. Hey, um, I'm trying to make this short. Um, I totally believe and perceive in every little single thing that that you've been talking about. I, I believe in that, and then. I think it's part of a reason why I'm still actually alive, to be to be honest with you. Um, there's religion thrown in there, you know, like a, a, a Christian. But here's the thing, too, which which is I'm lucky to be alive. I'm, you know, for the past 35 years, um, been a heavy, seedy lifestyle of alcohol and drugs. Um, I'm bipolar one on the high end of the mania. I never have a down ever. I don't know if that has anything to do with keeping me going, you know, and I have a blood disorder, I have neuropathy, I've broken my ankle in three different places, I can still walk, I have to use a cane, I can drive a car, but I, I'm, with everything that you're saying, I practice all that on a daily, nightly basis, intertwined with Christianity and the Bible, I mean, nobody has the power to know or knowledge to know the day of their death, and, and it's speeding up my, my death process, doing this. I don't know. What is keeping me alive? And I'll take my answer off the air. Thank you. 
<laughs> well, well, I thank you for that, and I'm, I'm glad you're still there. And what's keeping you alive, I mentioned real early in the program, something called the biological imperative, which is whole design is, is to keep you alive. Now, the other, the other part about this is that you have a strong force for life because many people give up life and they can die very quickly. And this happens especially uh, in couples where one of them dies and the other one dies within a year or so of the, of the first one because of that loss, nothing more than, than that reason. As much as people can die, there's another side of that that people can live and thrive through the worst of everything. So you have a mission. You're here to do something at some level. So I guess apparently it's not time for you to go yet, and, but you do have a, a, a drive, and that's the thing that can overcome those injuries and the, those issues that, that uh, physically attack us. Uh, we can change all that by, by our, our conscious and our subconscious beliefs. And, and apparently you are, are grabbing hold of this, uh, and, and it would be really great for you now to hook that, that, that intention to stay alive with a direction of what you, what you really want to do, because it seems like you have something to do. Let's go to John now in Fresno, California. Welcome to the program, John. Hi, Dr. Lipton. Uh It's nice to talk to you tonight. John, I'm glad you're here. Uh, uh, well, I'm, I've been battling hepatitis C for the last 15 years, and recently I heard that if you can stretch out the time between your meals, your main meals, that it makes the shape of your cells stronger. It, do you, is that true? I personally have not heard anything of that effect, uh, but I can tell you this is that um, viral infections are greatly influenced by your consciousness. Uh, I'll give an example. You know, AIDS is a virus that you get once and you got it your whole life. Herpes, uh, the, you know, the ones with fever blisters. That's a, the, almost the same kind of virus. You have it your whole life. Mm-hmm. What's the issue about it? And it is this. Some people let's get infected with a herpes virus and they get a fever blister once. Some people get infected with a herpes virus and they have a fever blister every month. It's the same virus. What's the difference? The answer is this. It's your stress levels that are encouraging the proliferation of the virus. And when people are not stressed, then those viruses are there, but they, they really don't take advantage of the system. This is why some people have had uh, AIDS infections for 20 or 30 years now. Like and Magic so, Johnson. Yeah, it's a different mentality. So uh, the fear is going to promote <laughs> the virus, and that's... Yeah, that's called the nocebo effect. We mentioned that earlier. It's like a negative belief will manifest a negative experience. And once you start to buy professional opinions about, well, this is your fate and all this kind of stuff, uh, uh, and you buy into it, uh, especially if they're negative ones, you will manifest those things. So it's interesting. Many medical diagnoses are actually uh, projecting <laughs> the patient's future by, by a nocebo effect. And so your issue is, you know, you've got this, uh, this thing going. The question is, it, it flares up in some people at times, and it goes down at other times. It, it's not the virus. It's really uh, the stress levels you deal with. And that's would, really the most important thing because that also cuts back the immune system at the exact same time. Bruce, is cancer a cell that has just gone crazy, or is it some kind of virus? Well, it's, it's a cell that has been stimulated so much. When, when we have um, uh, uh, an inflammation, uh, one characteristic of resolving an infl- inflammation is to cause the cells to divide. The reason is this. If you have inflammation, by definition, you're going to have damage. So in any inflammatory response, the cells are signaled, uh, especially the stem cells are signaled, to look, you're going to have to divide because we're going to have to repair this damage. It turns out that cancer is almost associated with a chronic inflammation and that the stem cells are being uh, called in to divide and to divide and to divide and somewhere along the line the signal system goes off and, and these stem cells just continue dividing. So that the cancer is really related to stem cells activated by inflammation uh, but then in some perpetuity, some change that goes on where it, it continues is where the problem is, but it started with the inflammation. So um, it, it, it's, inflammation causes the cells to divide. Mm-hmm. Too much inflammation, too much cell division. We're going to the home of uh, our C. Crane Company, Fortuna, California, Marjorie's turn. Marjorie, take it away. Hi. Hi, Hi Dr. Marjorie. Lipton. Hi. Hey, 
I am a 60-year-old woman who is ARH negative. And I guess you would find that somewhat interesting. That you're ARH negative? Yeah. Not necessarily, but am okay. I supposed to? I, I'm, <laughs> I'm not aware, okay. but you can well, tell me. you know, like 6% of the world are ARH negative. It's rare. That's right. It's yeah. very rare. And many of the things associated with being a neg is, um, you know, we, we have empathic abilities. Uh, electrical things go haywire. I can't be around computers. Batteries get drained. I walk under, you know, street lights will go out. Car alarms go off if I touch my car. You know, it's insane. In fact, I have to go out to the woods just to get grounded so that I don't have this constant ringing and this picking up ELF, uh, you know, by break, um, emissions and stuff like that. And um, plus that uh, the whole thing with an RH negative is a woman who is an egg has a child carrying one while pregnant, RH positive, and if the blood mixes, my body sees that as, an, you know, an invading body, like a bad thing, and will try to kill it. Now, there's no other species that does that. So, and, you know, in that case, sort of we're allowed one child. If one child gets through, usually, you know, that child will be very special. My son is, is positive, an A positive, but has extreme psychic abilities and... You know, you were talking about a mother when she knows her son's in trouble. That happened to me. You know, things like that I have with my son. Um, and he was even overseas, and I could still tell, you know, if something were wrong or how he was doing. But um, that also that uh, because we're called blue bloods, you know, most of our presidents are arch negative. But anyway, the point being um, that, um, that we have more copper in our blood which would be for, uh, you know, most people have iron, a large quantity of iron, and we have um, copper. Uh, okay, so I guess I sound like a nut job. But we are different. In fact, we find our own in a way. We find our own tribe, so to speak. I'll be in a crowd of people, and I just sort of find other negatives, and we validate each other in a lot of ways. All right. Well, uh, it's rare, Bruce, yeah, but it's, it's not uncommon. Uh, uh, no, and, and, and the fact is, uh, remember, you're, you're resonating a vibrational frequency, and those that have a similar frequency will move in your presence. That's how you can connect with people that are having the same kind of issues, because you're both sharing uh, uh, an energy spectrum. Uh, and that's what we talked about, resonance. So that's how those people show up in your life and how you come together with them. We've got uh, George in St. Louis now. Welcome to the show. George, go ahead. Good morning, Dr. Lipman. Good morning, George. Good morning. Good morning, George. Quick question. We're exposed every day to microwaves and radio waves, um, radio waves all the time, including um, um, uh, cosmic rays, which actually kill cells. Does, does any of these outside forces affect, affect us at all, the cell growth or even our personalities? Uh, absolutely, based on this. Uh, and, and it's interesting because the first study to recognize uh, the issue was uh, they were looking at families that live under high, high tension, high power lines to see if they have more cancer or diseases and things like that uh, compared to a normal population. And they found that it was very interesting that, indeed, there were people that there was more illness under there. But what they correlated that was, and this is a very important point about it, what they correlated was that the illness was also directly related to their stress levels. The more stress they were under, the more these outside energy forces affected them. The less stress they were under, then these forces really didn't penetrate the system. It's sort of like uh, as we get stressed, our, our, our barrier of energy, which we, we're surrounded by energy, you can see that with curly and stuff, gets little holes in it like, uh, and then all of a sudden we're permeable to, to things from the outside. So uh, it says, yes, you can be affected by these things, uh, but the effect is, is really directly related to the amount of stress that you live under. So that stress-free people, uh, uh, it, it, it's like that old wisdom that says, uh, surround yourself with white light. Well, white light is energy. You're surrounded, you have an energy sphere around you. Uh, all, all physical things do. 
the the whether that sphere can be penetrated or not is is really based on the stress level of the individual. So yeah, if you're under stress, those are very dangerous things that are affect the, that can affect you from the environment. If you're not under stress, then it's sort of like walking across hot coals. You can uh, uh, be out in that field, but it won't penetrate your body and affect you. So stress is the, again the key issue. It's uh, something that'll kill you, no doubt. John in Des Moines, Iowa. You're on with Bruce Lipton. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I'm just uh, I'm just thinking on hold here. How, how talk and, and and conversation and just the open inquiry is such a blessing. I, I thank you, thank you both tonight and and sure. everybody who helps makes this show happen. Um, but the, you're earlier you're talking about zero sum game versus uh, spirit of cooperation between uh, communities of cells, and, and that makes makes me think of the Native Americans. They'll like actually thank the spirit of their food before they eat it. And, and like uh, in the harmony of nature's balance, you'll have, well, I'll, I'll put it this way, a community of dog cells uh, hunt and eat the rabbit cells. But between entire nations, uh, the, the example that com- comes to my mind is the, the community of uh, socialism cells, if you will, like, like the Soviet Union kind of coming back. It, it will export ca- communism. And, and then it'll forcefully consume the private property cells of, of like former or smaller countries, and and then it gets nourished by by digesting them. But I just wanted to get your comment on um, in, pick and choose any of that, but really kind of the latter. So thank you. No, well, I, I thank you. I, I'm not really sure what we're we're ultimately picking on. Uh, in the guess of which topics you want to, which specific thing did you want to mention? So I can talk about one of them. Uh, do you take one, Bruce, because he has hung up? Oh, uh, help me out here, George. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, with the, with the waning moments that we've got here, let's get just a quick comment from you, and then we'll go to one or two more final callers here. But uh, you know, I guess if we paraphrase everything that's going on with people. We all have this innate ability to heal ourselves, to do incredible things, to have psychic ability by tapping into this. I I wish it would be easy to simply just mentally call up a phone number and you're in the system, but it's not, is it? No, uh, but then again, that's because of of the programming. Uh, It's like Aboriginal kids that grow up, like in Australia, let's say, they grow up in what kind of programming? They can read the field. They read all the energy. They know where the water is. They know where how to to live in that in that barren kind of environment because they they are programmed to read that. That doesn't make them different from us. We're just not programmed to read it. So uh, we have that that ability. So it really comes down to our abilities are a reflection of of what we've been programmed, uh, and mainly our programming has been disempowering programming. And, and this is actually, uh, in a sense of world order, <laughs> uh, that, that has been a mission, uh, because governments, uh, uh, really have a difficult time controlling people, but if you program into them to be submissive or be communist, as we talked about in one case there, whatever, uh, right. then they, they manifest that program, and, and, and we have certainly been, uh, programmed to be disempowered, and things that are taken away from us that uh, the so-called uh, whatever those other people are, uh, they use astrology, for example. That that's never been without. They've never been without astrology. But they then inform the public. Astrology is all just meaningless and useless stuff. Keep people away from that kind of thing. Every time they take away a power from us, and, and we've been programmed to be disempowered. And, and it's interesting because uh, this nature of being able to program a human. Uh, and control their life with the program is not new. It's, it's at least 400 years old because the Jesuits w- would always uh, boast, give me a child until it's six or seven and will belong to the church for the rest of its life. And I go, what? what does that mean? And what it means is this. If I can get the first seven years of a child's program, I control the fate of that child. George, I am so delighted. Thank you so very much for this invitation. And I, I just really want to thank you to give an opportunity to me to speak to this uh, wonderful audience you've created over the years, because those are the cultural creatives, the 
people looking outside the box for the answers are now finding inside. Absolutely. So, uh, I'm glad to be here for that. How'd you enjoy Santa Cruz? I love Santa Cruz. I've, I've met so many uh, recovering scientists. I couldn't believe how many people like myself that <laughs> were in university systems and then stepped outside because uh, the answers are really not to be found in there. And to find them all down there was such a uh, treasure, and I appreciate you being there. It was a great time. The people there were just so into everything, Bruce, that we were doing, and uh, and the weather was magnificent, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, this is uh, this is one of the reasons why I moved this far west to get out there and 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 to find this community because it really is a community that is uh, it, the the new thinking, the new, the new ideas are, are coming from here, and I so appreciate being here with them. They love you out there. My gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a hometown boy. <laughs> you are. I mean, I thought for a moment that you know they were going to bring you in, you know, with uh, in some kind of rickshaw or something, with people <laughs> carrying you, throwing rose petals at your feet as you came in. It's good. Well, yeah, they're a fun town. That's yeah, why we're here. They sure are. There are so many things I want to talk with you about because it, it isn't very often we get an opportunity to talk with a scientist who also has your belief system. Let's go back way before you became Bruce Lipton, the scientist. What were your beliefs when you were in your 20s, let's say? Well, by then I'd already uh, played with the concept that there was something called spirituality and there was something called science. And by the time I, I was uh, 10 years old, I'd already heard from so many spiritual people. You know, they say all those wonderful words of wisdom and all that. And then even in my child's eyes, I could see that, uh, their lives never match anything that they talk about. <laughs> it. And, and so I really lost interest in that, and, and I went into science and then got programmed into the science, which was the, the belief that, uh, oh, life is just the uh, accidental uh, series of genetic mutations that led to this human body, and we're here by accident and enjoy it, and, uh, and then that's it. And uh, that's where I was in the 20s. Did you have a quest to try to figure out why you're here, how you got here, is there a God? If it was, it surely wasn't conscious at any one level. I was uh, so much into the cells. The uh, first time I saw cells in a microscope uh, in grade school, uh, I, I was just mesmerized uh, to see these little these little moving organisms like amoebas, paramecia, moving around and, and realizing that they weren't bouncing around like a pinball in a machine. They were they were like looking over here, then they moved over here, and they were over there. And so they were yeah, they they were on purpose. And, and in my child's eye, I thought, oh my god, they're they're just like little people living in this other miniature world. And uh, from that moment on, uh, it led me to uh, my graduate work, which uh, ended up being an electron microscopist uh, and, and, and going through cells uh, into the molecular structure of them and, and living in there for a time and, and, and just taking in all the wisdom I could from the, the cells, which was really cool because I didn't start out, as you said, with what's my mission. I started out asking, show me something. Exactly. And, what it showed me was a, a new world and a new life, and, uh, and I'm just so excited because my book uh, that I wrote about it, that was out uh, it's, uh, in its 10th year, and it's, it's still selling <laughs> like it, it did in the first year uh, because more and more people are waking up to see that there's a new biology. And this new biology brings in things that you mentioned that I didn't even know were there until the cells revealed it to me, things such as uh, immortality, spirituality, mind over genes, uh, all this other stuff. It's like, oh, my God, uh, I was an avid student. And 10 years uh, of this book, and what was exciting is that Hay House asked me uh, to, uh, you know, how about revise and update the book for a 10th anniversary? I said, okay, and I read the book. I hadn't read it for years. And the joy of it was... Oh my God, I got to the end of the book. I said, no, I'm not changing a word in the original text. All the science in 10 years has fully endorsed everything that was in that book. So um, I just added a bunch of new things to it. Yeah. Uh, but I'm really excited because uh, a vision so long ago is now becoming mainstream science. Would you consider yourself today more of a spiritualist or a scientist? <laughs> I'd like to not separate those two. I'm trying things. I'm trying to trick you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a spiritual scientist now. <laughs> I mean it was uh, for me it was 
I was not looking for spirituality. So that, first of all, that was the biggest shock of my whole life. I mean, it was, I was looking at an understanding of, uh, of the mechanism of how the cell worked, and uh, when understanding uh, the, the structure of the, the, the skin of the cell, the cell membrane, it's a, it's a computer chip, actually. It's a carbon-based computer chip. And uh, what I saw was, oh, my God, um, the, the structure and function of that membrane revealed that our identity is not found inside the cell. Our identity, what makes each of us different, is represented by an environmental signal that is picked up by uh, special proteins like miniature television antennas on the surfaces of our cells. So no two people have the same set of these antennas. It's like a combination lock. of It's receiving identity frequencies from the field. What was the point? That our identities are, are, are picked up from the field and played through the cell through these receptors uh, and what you know instantaneously is like oh my god i said i realized it's like well if the cell dies uh, the signal in the field is always a signal in the field it's there until a future cell with the same set of receptors shows back up i love that uh, and then that that uh, broadcast will be playing through a new body uh, but the whole idea about it is the broadcast is immortal and we are the broadcast and it was like <laughs> that moment I just looked at it and said, wait, I'm not in here. <laughs> and it was, oh, my God. And it didn't, it wasn't like, okay, Bruce, how many years of devotion did it take to, you know, fall into being spiritual? And it's like, well, how about a minute or maybe 45 seconds or something like that? Because it was a mechanism. And it was just as clear as 2 plus 2 is 4. It's like, oh, my God, identity is picked up by antennas on the surface of the cell from signals in the environment. And it was like. Well, that was blew my mind, but it changed everything, you know. And it's real interesting, yeah. uh, George, and all of us have this this feeling inside of us. It's not always conscious, but it's running uh, every day, all day long. It, 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 there, there's something built into all biological organisms called the biological imperative. And I said, well, what's that? I said, well, it's the drive to stay alive. And I go, well, what does that mean? I said, well, even an organism as primitive as a bacterium will not sit there and say, okay, kill me. If you try to kill a bacterium, it's going to do everything it can to stay alive. So every organism from the most primitive bacterium up through humans and above, every organism has this drive to stay alive. And, and what does that mean? It means that we are on guard every moment with our unconscious mind, observing the world, looking for what? Things that threaten us. Yeah. And, right. and, and, and the reason is, is obviously because we grow up to know that we're mortal and, and we got to watch out. And so there's this on guard. Al allows you to do this. It's the field. And when you can tap into the field, that's where people's intuitions come from. If you can tap into it and yep. let go of your earth based moment and get out for a moment, you can come back with all this amazing information. It's all out there. Uh, but we've been programmed not to see it. We've been programmed to go away from it. We've been programmed not to pay attention to our biology, in a sense. It's, a, it's an amazing uh, turnabout for uh, this biology, because what is should be heaven, uh, for most people, this is a hell of a life for a lot of people. <laughs> and, yeah. and, uh, and yet, we have this great opportunity. So uh, an interesting point about it is uh, uh, the, the movie The Matrix, uh, when you go into a video store, say, where, where, where do I find the Matrix? And they say, oh, it's in science fiction. I go, no, you know what? It's a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> well we said. Have, we have been programmed. And, and it's interesting because uh, we, people have had an opportunity. Most people have taken the red pill at one time or another in their life. And, and it had a profound impact when they took the red pill. And, and you say, well, when was that? And I say, science has recognized is that when we fall in love. Bruce, right. we're going to come back with you in just a moment, talk more about all your work and the power of consciousness on Coast to Coast AM. Okay, we're back with Dr. Bruce Lipton. His website, by the way, linked up at coasttocoastam.com is brucelipton.com as we talk about his works, the honeymoon effect, spontaneous evolution, the biology of belief as well. Bruce, have you continued that quest of trying to decide and, and find out why are we here, or have you passed that and gone on to something else? 
Well, uh, as I was leaving off, I, I really think is because we came here to, to create, uh, and, and we came with a mission. Uh, and I, I think what we're really trying to, to see is an evolution that's in process right now, so that it's all coming together, uh, and, and it's kind of interesting because it, as this evolution is in process, we're also seeing the termination of the current civilization, uh, which is required to make room for this new evolution that's, that we're on the threshold of right now. So when we look around at the world and see all the crises and we can focus on each individual crisis and talk about each individual one, it, it really is one overall big crisis that covers all of them, and that is uh, that we are not sustainable and that we're facing our own extinction. And it really requires us to make an evolutionary jump at this time. And so, uh, well, a lot of people are looking out and, of course, uh, rightfully feeling fear and, and anxiety about uh, the future of what's happening here and, and seeing all the trouble. I, I look at it in a, a very different way. It's like this is very exciting <laughs> because this mm. is uh, the birth pain of creating a new civilization. We're ending an existing civilization and moving into uh, a new civilization. And, um, again, this is why uh, I so appreciate your audience, because they, they fully represent cultural creatives in this movement. When you have talked about the basics of biology of belief, explain that. Well, okay, as I started out in, uh, in my non-spiritual form, I, I was a conventional biologist, and I was looking at the nature of uh, cell mechanics and mechanisms. I was focusing on cells ever since my my uh, uh, elementary school days. And uh, what I was working on was um, what controls the fate of a cell. Well, of course, uh, at the same time I was doing this research, I was teaching students that genes control life because that's my program, too. I got a program, genes control life, and we always talk about things like genes turning on and off and genes uh, uh, actually um, determining our fate. I say this because uh, there's interesting science, and it's based on, uh, well, everyone's familiar with EEG electroencephalograph. You put wires That's on a right. person's uh, skull, uh, and you can read the electrical activity to the brain because the electrical activity is conducted to the skin, and the wires pick it up, and you can read brain function. I go, yeah, great, but... There's a new technology, and it's called not electroencephalograph. It's called magnetoencephalograph. So it reads magnetic fields. What's interesting? The probe does not touch your head. The probe is outside of your outside head. of your skull, isn't it? Yeah. Outside of your skull it has no connection to your body at all. And what are you doing? You're reading your brain function. And all of a sudden, so what does it mean? There's only one simple understanding: your thoughts are not contained. In your head, your thoughts are broadcast out into the field. And, and all of a sudden, it's like, oh, my God, this is this two-way street uh, that, that we're sort of like, um, uh, a simple way to put it is uh, we're like a, a, a Mars rover in this regard. It's a, essentially, let's say, I want to know what Mars is like, but I can't get there. But I really want to know what a human experience of Mars would be. So I send up this rover, and it looks like a fancy go-kart and all that kind of stuff. And I, I say, yeah, but it, no matter what it looks like, guess what it is? It's the equivalent of a human. It has eyes to see with. It's got taste receptors to sample the soil. It's got, and the it's got wheels like legs. It's got move around. It, yeah. it, got, it does everything. But guess what? So the guy at NASA sends a signal drives the rover around, but the rover, meanwhile, is picking up with all its sensory apparatus information about what it's like to be, all the, you know, the experiences of living on Mars, and sends it back to the guy at NASA via, you know, the same antenna. I'm going, we, and this is the cool part, <laughs> we are like Earth rovers. We came here, we jump into this virtual reality suit with our antennas, we're connected to the suit, and whatever the suit uh, experiences, that information is translated into vibration, which is then sent back to source. So we came here for these experiences. Uh, and then, of course, since just like the rover, there's a driver, it moves the vehicle around, so it's not random. We came here on a mission as Earth rovers to experience life. And, and what's so exciting about it is, is that well, a lot of people think, okay, you, you're dead, then if you have a good life, you can go to heaven. I'd like to suggest something that's totally cosmically weird and different, and that is, no, no, 
you were born into heaven. You were born to be here to do what? Take that consciousness that spirit represents, but turn it into a device that moves around on the planet, can do things, and can take the experiences and send it back. So we came here for experiences. And uh, uh, unfortunately, we've been hijacked. <laughs> so, yeah, that's uh, true. I, I say, well, this is heaven, and you look around and go, it sure don't look like it. I go, well, uh, that's because we've been hijacked. We've been programmed to to lose our mission, and uh, we lost it. And uh, But it's available for us to come back and recognize this was heaven. This is where we came to create. This is great. I have always wondered with remote viewers how they are able to, and I practice it too now, but how they were able to remote view things, past and present, by being outside of their body, their minds would go out and literally become their eyes and see things in the future or see things from the past. And it's much like what you're saying. It's like everything is outside of the human body. It's this tapping into this wireless Internet out there, Bruce. That Yeah, all the time, looking at everything, looking everywhere, not keeping your conscious mind uh, or, you know, uh, involved with it until it sees something, but uh, it's working all the time. So what happened? The moment I recognized I'm not in here, I'm an immortal being, a broadcast, uh, a spirit that plays through this mechanism, I, I felt this and lightning, George. I mean, it was just light, a, a lightning of my body, a lightning of my life. What was it? The fear of death slipped away. The first time in my life, fear of death, just like gone. And what happened? Freedom. It was the most exciting freedom. Very refreshing, wasn't it? Oh, my God. I mean, for a guy who was zero spirituality and A and B, not <laughs> looking even for it, then to stumble on it was like, Oh my God! Uh, uh, it's funny. I, uh, uh, it was so uh, emotional an experience to understand the mechanism of how the cell worked. That uh, I, I've been an academician. I worked from my head forty years. Everything's from my brain. My brain. The moment this understanding came in about how cells work and spirituality, it wasn't my brain that really affected uh, affected that. It was my heart. And uh, all of a sudden, I remember it, at that moment of understanding, tears were coming down my eyes. I was choked up, uh, and I realized I was so so choked up because of my heart, uh, and I, I now refer to this as my heart orgasm, <laughs> the first time I felt that experience. <laughs> and really what it was was that a truth that was so deep came in, and, and my life changed. Oh, time. it's it's got to be profound, Bruce. Once that hits you, the way it hit you and so many other people, I hope, get to that stage, it's got to be a profound feeling, isn't it? Oh, I, I, it's, you can't put it in any description that I could try to make that will relay the, uh, the emotional content of touching a, a truth of the universe. And it, is it a truth? Well, uh, look, uh, I understood this. This was uh, really back by 1980 I started getting all this. And, and every, every bit of science since 1980 is fully substantiated all of that original finding so uh to me it's like oh wow <laughs> i saw this yeah, it was kind of fun there there, there was a, a, a funny response because there was this moment i was like okay i'm not a spiritual person and all of a sudden it's like okay spirit exists and then i was in this little quandary it's like i asked myself well you know why have a spirit and a body why not just be the spirit and I could feel the answer welling up through my cells. Apparently, I must have Jewish cells because I asked the question, <laughs> why have both? And the answer came in the form of a question. And the question is, like, very funny but very profound. I said, why have both a spirit and a body? Why not just be a spirit? And the answer from 50 trillion cells was simply this. Bruce, if you're just a spirit, what does chocolate taste like? You know, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> it makes well, a lot it, of sense, and you can you could equate that with a lot of things on this planet. Well, it's that's the whole point of it. We have a nervous system that responds to sensory input, and I go, well, that's really nice. But guess what? The signals that bring the identity into the body are the same receptors that forward the message back to source again, so that. When you taste something, you see something, you hear something, you smell something, when you feel something like love or fear, um, those are sensory perceptions 
that are translated by the nervous system into vibration. So a picture that you see with your eyes is actually a bunch of vibrations that go to the brain, or a taste of chocolate is a bunch of vibrations that go to the brain. I go, well, they go to the brain, but guess what? We also now know that those signals that come into the brain that we sense are not locked in our head. 